The Open Door Baptist podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. Chapter number one, and uh, gentlemen, if you want, get the lights, Brother Andrew. Just a quick video introduction kind of uh, to the message. We'll get right into it as soon as this is done. Thank you very much. There is a sense in the world, there's a sense among believers, there's a sense among unbelievers, there's a sense among all peoples that things are unhinged. The Middle East is unhinged with uprisings, revolution. How are followers of Jesus to relate to all of these things? How do they relate to biblical prophecy? America is in spiritual, moral crisis. Uh, values are changing, and so rapidly. I mean, that have not happened in the history of man. How are level-headed, responsible Christians to relate to the testimony of the biblical prophets and the unfolding of chaos throughout the world? Not just believers are wondering, is this a sign of the end? All right, thank you, gentlemen. Revelation chapter 1, and I want to read just one verse, kind of as a catalyst into the message. Revelation chapter 1, and just look at, actually look at verse number 3, and then we'll read verse 8, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, speaking of the book of Revelation that John is about to unveil, and keep the things which are written therein. Notice what he says, for the time is, what's the last few words? At hand. We'll talk a little bit in, in a moment about what that means, knowing it was 2,000 years ago roughly, that that was stated. You say, well, that was 2,000 years ago, and he's saying the time's at hand. We'll see why in just a moment. Jump over to verse 8. If you would, look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time and again for your word. And we're asking that you'll meet with us today in a special way and help us to properly discern the times in which we live in. I pray that you'll give us wisdom in doing so as I believe emphatically that we are living in the last days of the church and help us to look at things through the lens of scripture help us to keep our eyes focused on you and on the things that matter help us not to get caught up in trivial things when we live in 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 such grave and dire times we see what's going on around the world and help us to stay cognizant of that, that we can bring honor and glory to you by, by yielding to you, by being used of you. And Father in heaven, I pray in this service that there's somebody that has graced these doors that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Help them to understand that God, you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I pray for their salvation today. We love you. We thank you for loving us. We ask your blessing upon this brief time we have together, in Jesus' name, and amen. This is the beginning of the series titled, Discerning, uh, the Spirit of Prophecy, really the subtitle, Discerning the Times. Specifically, this message will be about us kind of looking at the day and age that we live in and properly judging the times 
and hopefully doing that through the lens of Scripture. I think that's imperative. If we trust our own intellect, or we look at the things uh, and our, uh, through other different aspects, I think it's going to have a negative impact and thwart our view in terms of what God would have for us. And as we'll also be looking at the judgments of God. That'll be next week. The judges return. And then lastly, judging ourselves. But I want to jump right into the message here today. And I want you to look in your booklets, if you would. Notice if the very beginning, the condition of our world. That's what I want to look at, first of all. The condition of our world. Would you turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 24, please? Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24, and let's look at verse number 3, Matthew 24, verse 3. Some of these references will be in your notes, and others uh, will kind of reference as we go through. But again, thank you for being here for the kickoff to our prophecy series. I'm trusting that you'll get a blessing as we look into the Word of God and consider these things. Matthew 24, verse 3, Jesus Christ here on the Mount of Olives, he's sitting here and uh, the disciples are coming to him and asking him these questions. Notice verse 3, it says privately, saying, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall it be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? He gives them the answer, folks, and, and it's still relevant today, and we'll see why in just a moment. Here's the answer, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation. Uh, look up here for just a minute. That's always happened, but it's going to happen. Um, it's going to escalate even more and more and more as time goes on. Keep reading. Kingdom shall rise against kingdom. There shall be famine and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Uh, let me just say this real quick as we, before we continue to read. That will increase even more. Yes, already we're seeing an increase in pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Yes, uh, statistically we're seeing that on a larger scale. But even more so, prior to the Lord's return, it's going to happen even more. And again, we're talking here, Matthew 24, this is the second advent. This is in reference to Jesus Christ coming back to the earth, his feet touching the Mount of Olives, not the rapture of the church. I think it's imperative that you understand that. Uh, keep reading, if you would, verse number eight. Here's what he says. All these are the beginning of what? Notice the disciples asked a very important question to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, tell us when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of their coming? And they say, what shall be the end of the world? If we are going to properly discern the times, folks, I, th I think it's vitally important that we stay abreast to the things that are going on in our day and age. We don't need to be blinded to them. Uh, you don't need to stay glued to the television and the media and what have you because it's going to bring you down. I think there's a good balance you need to obviously monitor your media intake, as I've talked about extensively before, but many Christians are blinded to just basic things that are happening around them, even in the realm of Christendom or with the nation of Israel specifically. Now, I'll say I, I, I believe this. We don't need to live in fear, but I do believe we need to, to do as the Bible says, and that is look to the heavens, for our redemption draweth nigh. Be mindful of the things that are going on around us. Listen, with the with the horrendous attacks of 2001 on the United States of America still etched in our mind and more recently in Paris and San Bernardino and you see those things everywhere you turn and yes, that is escalating. With all those things in mind, violence and terrorism in our land has become a major concern of our government and, and governments around the world and it's left many people asking, this question, are we living in the last days? What does the Bible say about the last days? People are worried, they're fearful. 
what can happen to them or what could happen to their families in such perilous times. Now think about this for a minute. If you're saved, if you're saved, you don't need to worry. You don't need to fear. If you do fear, if you're sitting here today and you're like, yeah, I am kind of worried. I'm worried about this and I'm worried about that. I'm worried about that. Understand, God's not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Meaning you're going to think soberly. And that's how we ought to think. But there's many, unfortunately, even Christians that are living in fear. And really, that's, the, the stark reality is that they're not grounded enough or lack that faith where they can't just say, listen, God, I'm in your hands. Does the Bible say safety is of the Lord? Then we should say, praise God, Lord, if something happens. What, what's the worst thing that could happen to the child of God? What's the worst thing? You die, you get killed, and if you're saved, you go where? What's that's the worst thing that could happen to you? So you really don't need to live in fear, but if you're unsaved, you understand, and the media is notorious for working everybody up and getting people to, to live in fear. And no doubt with some of the terrorist attacks that have happened during uh, different places, yes, times are less safe than they used to be. So there's no doubt about that. But I don't think that you need to live in fear. How are we supposed to respond to these evil days? Remember the Lord gave the warning as his day approached. We would see these things occurring in the world. Paul addresses it as well. He says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, disobedient to parents, and so on and so on. He concludes that little section by saying this, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. May I submit to you today, there is no doubt in the hour in which we live. You're looking at a preacher that believes the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ is breathing down our neck. I believe it. I believe it. And we'll see why in just a little bit. Keep in mind, empires come and go. The natural tendency is for people to assume that their nation is going to continue forever. But just a casual reading of history of mankind will reveal to you that even the greatest nations may sink into oblivion overnight and new nations emerge. All these changes in political fortune don't happen by chance. The events of history lie in the sovereign hands of God who is actively carrying forward his plan in the world. May I even say he rules in the affairs of men. He's intricately involved in nations and governments and we'll see that in Daniel. As a matter of fact, just real quickly, if you would look at Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter number 2, turn there if you would. You know, the Lord doesn't leave us in dark about his plan. Have you ever heard Christians say, usually kind of with a sigh of resignation, they say, yes, I know that God is still on the throne, but, but, you know, some people get the impression that God's about to be knocked off his throne by whatever misfortune is taking place. Je Jesus Christ is on his throne and he's ruling the affairs of men. Yes, we, ha we have a free will, but God is also sovereign. And the truth is, not is he only on his throne, but he's actively and sovereignly controlling the affairs of man to suit his own purpose. The problem is many times we don't look at things the way God looks at things. Look at Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 21. He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings, and notice what he says, and setteth up what? Kings. We understand clearly from this verse, God's in absolute control. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up new ones. So as we think about the condition of our world, where are we at on God's calendar? As you think about numerology, as you think about dispensations and basic Bible hermeneutics, where are we on God's calendar? I'm going to show you just briefly here uh, a dispensational chart that shows you from the very beginning, innocence and conscience and, and, uh, and uh, government and promise and law, grace and so on. So here we are, um, right there, all these things have already taken place. Here you have the Garden of Eden and so on. We've dealt with these, I've taught them extensively on Sunday evenings or Thursday nights um, for months and months and months. But understanding where you are on God's calendar is important. You know what's funny? Many times I, I, I make the mistake of assuming 
that everybody already kind of knows this is where we are on God's calendar. But that's a major mistake when you assume because not everybody, you know, they just, they don't. And so I need to make sure I, I don't overlook things and just assume people know. Uh, keep in mind when it comes to the law, that's Exodus 19, really Exodus 19, Exodus 20. Moses uh, is given the law by God and comes down and so on. You know the story. That, that dispensation goes all the way through the gospels until the Lord Jesus Christ is crucified. Because if you read in Colossians, the Bible says, speaking of Christ, he was blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which are against us, nailing it to the cross. So the law was fulfilled when Jesus Christ was crucified. Amen. So, but here we are right here. We're waiting for one thing. There's the next thing on God's calendar is the rapture of the church. First Thessalonians chapter number four. That is when he calls the church out of here. Can you imagine what this world's going to look like when the church is gone? When the salt is taken out of the earth? Think about the chaos that, that, that's, that's going to be. But if you read in Daniel, you find out about the little horn that rises up. That little horn. That's the Antichrist who uh, is going to, you know, cause all both small and great to receive a mark in their forehead or in their right hand, which is 606 score and six. It's the number of man. So, Grace, here you have, right here, the rapture of the church takes place right in here, and then the seven-year tribulation period starts. That's known as Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week. Once the tribulation, once the rapture happens, then the seven-year tribulation takes place, which is going to make Hitler's day look like a Sunday picnic. If you read your Bible, you'll find that. If it wasn't for the elect's sake, the Bible says, no flesh would be saved. So you have that. And then the seven, after the seven-year tribulation period, Lord Jesus Christ, Revelation 19, comes back to the earth, sets up his kingdom, and the 12 disciples sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel, and Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of David with a rod of iron. You have 2 Chronicles chapter 9, the Queen of Sheba coming up out of Ethiopia, which is a perfect picture of the Gentile nations that will come to Israel during that millennial kingdom. Isaiah chapter number 60 and 61, you have a great picture of that. So there's your uh, king, uh, millennial kingdom, Revelation 20, lasts a thousand years years. So there's where we are in God's timeline. Guess what? The next thing on God's calendar is the rapture of the church. Is there anything here that you would like to stay for? Because I'm ready to go. How about you? Next, notice in your notes, if you would, the condition of the church. The church. Condition of the church. First Timothy chapter 4. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Uh, look up here for just a minute. That even means grounded, I've, well I shouldn't say it even means, I've seen grounded Christians who once believe what you believe depart from the faith and they give heed to a seducing spirit. It could be a seducing spirit that's in Romanism or it could be a seducing spirit that all of a sudden things have changed in the church where, <laughs> hey, things aren't like they used to be. And we'll show, I'll give you some things in just a minute that are indicative in Christendom today that are seducing people under the auspice of Christianity. Look down at the uh, end of the verse. It says, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, I'm going to take just a minute and I want to talk to you about it. We looked at the condition of the world briefly. I could have done the whole message on that, but here's the condition of the church. Paul's writing on the inspiration of the Spirit of God prior to the return of Christ, stating what's going to happen to the body of Christ prior to the return. Please, let me say this real quickly, kind of a parenthetical here. Watch. This, this is the church, okay? The last days of the church, which Paul refers to, is different than the last days of the nation of Israel. Please understand that. That's why when Christians camp in Matthew 24... That's why they don't even understand the security of the believer. Well, it says in Matthew 24, verse 13, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Well, it also says, those that be in uh, Judea, flee to the mountains. I pray your flight not be on the Sabbath. It is clearly a depiction of the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the last days of the nation of Israel. 
And if earthquakes are happening more often and wars are happening more often and pestilence and diversity, all that stuff, it just means the second advent is that much closer, which, hey, listen, it just means the rapture is that much closer, amen? Because if you know your Bible and you know the timeline, you know the rapture happens before Jesus Christ's feet touch the Mount of Olives and he sets up that kingdom. Now, doctrines of devils. Notice Paul says in the last days, there's gonna be seducing spirits. Listen, I'll, I'll say it again so you understand. We're living in the last days. And I'm going to give you a few examples of that in a minute. But there's going to be different things that happen. Get, let me give you a couple examples of a doctrine of a devil. Here's one. Knowing what a devil would teach that a Jewish woman was omnipresent and sinless. Listen, that is a doctrine of a devil. No one but a devil would teach that she was a mediator between God and man. No one but a devil would teach that Christ's blood was not complete and finished payment for the sins the day that it was shed or that Christians had to burn a while in purgatory to get clean. You say, well, that's kind of harsh. I think I know who you're talking about. It's a doctrine of a devil. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? It's contrary, diametrically opposed to the word of God. I love the beginning of the verse. It says, the Spirit speaketh expressly. Plain words that anybody could understand. Contrary to the scholarly fog and the liturgical process that you see going through all different kinds of religion. That's the thing you have to understand. Everything we're talking about in the last days, doctrines of devils and seducing the Spirit, isn't happening at Joe's bar. It's happening in the Christian realm. That's how people are deceived. If it wasn't for the very elect's sake, the Bible says, and so all, all no flesh would be saved. A doctrine of a devil would be intertwined with some, intertwined with some truth. Remember this, please. Every heresy is a truth misplaced. Keep in mind, the Antichrist will be very religious. Notice again, verse number one, that in the latter times, you and I are in them, plain and simple, Numerology will show you that. Can I take, let's say, 90 seconds or two minutes and show you what I, what I referenced in Revelation 1, the day is at hand, okay? And then what uh, Paul talks about saying, in the last days, perilous times shall come. I'm gonna give you, some of you already know this, some of you do not, but I wanna give you real quickly in probably two minutes, a perfect example to show you how God looks at things different than we look at them, especially when it comes to time. Here, here's an example. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3.8, I think they should have it behind me. Listen to this. Look at, don't be ignorant. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So watch this. Hey, Jesus died the day before yesterday. Amen. Our time is different than his time. So, follow the logic, if you would, as we think about the things that would be indicative of the last days. Nothing stands out more to me than the numerical aspect of where we are today. God set a standard in the Bible that has stood the test of time. Leviticus 23 and verse number three is a good principle. Six days thou shalt work, but on the seventh day is a day of rest. It's a day of rest. God's prophetic system of millennial days is clear in the Bible. Run six days with the seventh day of rest. The example would be the earth was created in six days and on the seventh day he rested. Man was to work six days. The seventh day he rested. So according to 2 Peter 3.8, pull that back up again, Chase, if you would. God is saying that the earth at some point is going to enter a rest. You say, when's that going to be? Well, right now, if you go from creation until now, we're, numerically speaking, we're in the year 6,016. Roughly, roughly. Jewish calendars off a little bit. I think God did that and allowed that for a reason because no man will know the hour of the day. Nobody knows when he's going to come back, but we'll have an idea. Many will ask the question, so according to God's timeline, 
at the end of 6,000 years, or according to 2 Peter 3, 3, 8, at the end of six days, listen carefully, the earth is going to enter a time of rest, period. That's what you call the millennial kingdom. It's called a time of rest. That's Revelation 20. It lasts for 1,000 years. Hey, so, the, so six days, and then on the seventh day of rest, Revelation 20, in six different spots, it says it will last a thousand years. Many ask what happens after 6,000 years and the Lord comes back. Then you have Isaiah 11. During that millennial time, the lion will lay down with the lamb and the millennial kingdom will be set up. So as of today, with our calendars, we're at the year 6,016, considering the Jewish calendar is a little bit different than ours, some say they've overlooked the fact that our calendar is in error by about 30 years because it was set back to zero on the day that Christ was born rather than on the year that he began his ministry. Either way, either way, either way. Hey, listen, our redemption draws nigh. Either way, plain and simple. So I believe the Lord could come back any time now. Many, many people, when you say that, will scoff at you and laugh. I told the earlier service, I said, listen, go to work tomorrow and tell them, listen, I believe it. Jesus Christ is coming back and he's coming back soon. And they, and they may scoff at you. But the Bible even prophesies of them scoffing. Because the Bible says in Peter they, that many will scoff at you when you say that. Second Peter, matter of fact, I think it's in chapter three. It says this. Oh, it's in a couple spots. Uh, yeah, 2 Peter 3, 4. Knowing this first, that there shall be in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where's the promise of his coming? You told me at work that Jesus was coming back. Hey, where's the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they are. Hey, let's eat, let's drink, and let's be merry. For tomorrow we die. And that's the mindset of the world. But if you're a saved child of God and you believe this book, you know Jesus Christ is coming back and you need to remember this world is not your home. No preacher is worth his salt that is not constantly reminding himself and his people Jesus Christ is coming back. Look to the heavens. Your redemption draweth nigh. The apostasy of the church is real having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Uh, listen carefully, if you would. I just snapped my thingy back here. The church that we're seeing today on many different fronts. Can I, can I just say this as a, a side note? This is, would be more of a controlled parenthetical than a rabbit trail. But I'll tell you this. The signs are clear to the Bible believer. You say, well, what do you mean? As you look at it, Take respective ministries that, that you may know of that on the, on the outside, under the auspice of Christianity. Hey, listen, uh, Brother Drew mentioned it this morning. Many churches canceled their service because there's a football game on. Hey, I'm for a game. I got a Hawks jersey on underneath here. Go Hawks! But I'm not at all going to ever misplace that in the things that matter most. And God rebuke us all if we ever allow that to happen. So the church that we're seeing today on many different fronts uh, is clear to the Bible believer when it comes to many different aspects. Ecumenical in nature, holding hands with those that deny the deity of Christ and the blood atonement and the second advent. Overly tolerant with worldliness. Complete lack of separation where you can't even tell the difference between them and the world when you're told to be different than the world. Come out from among them and be separate, the Bible says, saith the Lord. How about this? Outward conformity, but inward carnality. I told the early crowd, you're not going to get this preacher to stand up here in skinny jeans with a white t-shirt that says, I'm cool, or whatever. And some of you are saying, thank God for that. Bad visual. <laughs> Won't endure sound doctrine. Preaching like this, nah, it wouldn't last till the butter melted. Why? Because it infringes on what they want to do. Listen, you can have fun serving God. This isn't about, well, if I'm a Bible-believing Christian and a conservative one of that, that I can't do and I can't do, I can't. No, 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 I get to do. 
Brother Jude just gave testimony. He's like, man, this, I get to serve Jesus. I'm consumed with it, praise God. Hey, he's coming back soon. You better be consumed with it. Won't endure sound doctrine. How about this? Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. <laughs> Things that you never thought that you would see are happening today. Not in the world. Forget the world. You can't say anything about them. You expect that. But in the church... Things are taking place. You're like, what? They? Are you kidding? I never thought I'd see the day. And it's here and it's real. See, what is that? Paul prophesied in the last times. Thought they want to be able to endure sound doctrine, listen careful, and have a seared conscience. How about this? What's, what's a sign of that? And many of you have visited other churches. You, you look for a church home. Your family moves here. We're looking for a church. And, and, and I've talked to many of you. That's why I sent out a mailer a long time ago where church is still like going to church, Open Door Baptist Church, a conservative church in a liberal world, amen. The gospel message absent. You say, what do you mean by that? There's churches all across this country where no gospel message will be given. What are, what are, we, what are we doing then? Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. He didn't say, woe unto me if I don't get clean drinking water to a lost and dying world, and I'm for clean drinking water, but it's the gospel that's most important. And lastly, an improper emphasis on humanistic ideals. I want you to listen carefully to this, if you would. It's been stated by many religious leaders that one of the greatest moral challenges that the church faces today, brace yourself, is global warming. And I'm not saying that to make fun of whatever science has discovered. I'm just telling you, and I have my own opinion on it. If you talk to me later, then I may tell you, I may not. But do you understand, if, if, if I'm talking under the auspice of Christianity, if somebody's standing up there and saying, as a Christian and as leaders with influence saying, one of the greatest moral challenges the church faces today is global warming. Have you lost your mind? Where do you find that in the Bible? May I, may I say kindly, friend, you haven't opened the Bible and you don't know what's near and dear to the heart of God. At all. At all. And I'm not even going to debate scientifically with anybody of whether or not global warming is real or not. That's not the issue. The issue is if that's one of the, what religious leaders are saying is one of the greatest moral challenges that the first the church faces today, good night, we've, we've just completely lost it. And may I say as a side note, global warming is and will become a reality, will it not? Does the Bible not say that the heaven and the earth shall pass away and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat? So I guess they are onto something. It just isn't happening gradually, it's just going to happen all at once. Keep in mind, we're talking about the church, the condition of the church. These are the signs of apostasy. The Bible's predicted these things will come to pass. Lastly, in your notes, notice the condition of Israel. Condition of Israel. Look at Zechariah 12 in your notes. In that day, I'll make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. According to the Bible, as time goes on, Jerusalem is going to become a burdensome stone. It's a biblical prophecy that's indicative of the last days. Zechariah 12. That's what it says. It's going to become a burdensome stone. Israel will become more and more a thorn in the flesh. And you'll hear more and more talk about the Jews being the problem. Listen for this term, Zionism. Specifically, Zionist Jews. Orthodox as time goes on, the world began to turn more and more against the nation of Israel. In essence, they'll be portrayed as the ones who are hindering the process. Let me show you, uh, you'll see the map behind me. I'm going to bring a point out to you in just a minute. Does it ever uh, seem odd to you or disproportionate that a country of only 7.2 million people that's, that's a little bit smaller, I believe, than the state of New Jersey has all this global attention? Here's Algeria and Libya and Sudan and Chad and Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and Afghanistan and Kazakhstan and Iran and there's Iraq and there's Syria and there's Turkey. Wow. And all of this coverage and all, what's the big to do? In and of itself, you ought to say there's something to it if it wasn't just for that. Listen, one of the proofs of the greatest truths of the existence of God is the Jew. You can't figure him out if your life depended on it. What's this little 
I can't even hold it still enough. What's that right there? You, can, you can't see it. It's, that's Israel, that brown right there. That's Israel. Is it coincidence that it's the focal point of Bible prophecy? People often, question, often ask the question, why Israel carries so much prophetic significance? Much of the conflict in Israel, again, keep in mind, it centers around the land. So how does this land dispute relate to Bible prophecy? It goes back to Genesis chapter 12. God calls Abraham, get thee out of thy country and thy kindred and go to a land that I will show thee of. God promised to bring Abraham to a land he had never seen. I'm going to show you a picture here of a courtyard of the Dome of the Rock, the Temple Mount, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's interesting that in our, own, in, in our own day, one of the most significant controversies occupying the nations is that of the jurisdiction over the Temple Mount. I want you to take a look at that for just a minute and think about this. What an incredible coincidence that what should be inconsequential and a forgotten piece of real estate associated with religious antiquity today causes great perplexity both among religious people and secular skeptics alike. As of 2016, the most dominant visible feature on the Temple Mount is the Dome of the Rock. But this is from man's point of view. God has a completely different perspective. Uh, we've been here on the, the Temple Mount area Mount Moriah through here, and uh, we'll see why it's so important to God. We'll see the significance of it. Abraham, if you remember, the importance of Mount Moriah is established by some historical events. Abraham, Genesis chapter 22, Abraham offered Isaac there on Mount Moriah. In 900 BC, this is where Solomon built his temple. The world and religious leaders all look at the Dome of the Rock. It has nothing to do with what's sitting there. It has to do with what the significance of that piece of property is and what's below it and what was there and what will happen in the future, may I say. Uh, I'll tell you something interesting. We were in Israel and when we were there, they first of all wouldn't let me carry my Bible onto the Temple Mount. Second of all, all of Jerusalem is, that's a great picture, all of Jerusalem is, listen, all of that is controlled by the Jews and that all there, but the Temple Mount is controlled by the Muslims. That would be like, that would be like Olympia being controlled by Saddam Hussein. We have all of Washington State as ours, but Olympia is controlled by Saddam uh, Hussein. But he's not here anymore, whoever, whoever. Ahmadinejad, whoever. You understand what I'm saying? But that's what's going on there. And if you read in 1967 in the Six Day War, it was almost granted back. They almost got it back, that area. But some interesting things happened and that's for another time. So what have we done today? As I kind of conclude these thoughts. What have we looked at? We looked at real simply the condition of our world, the condition of the church, and the condition of Israel. Really we just touched the hem of the garment, but as I conclude, may I ask you this? And you can ask yourself this question. What is the condition of my own soul? If the Bible's true, and I believe it is, the, it, it's appointed on a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. There's no way around it. It doesn't matter if you don't believe it, it's a stark reality. So knowing that, my desire today, if you're saved, is that you'll live for Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, it's that you'll put your faith in him. Not in religion, not in any denomination, but in the finished work of Christ. Let's bow in prayer.